this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Corey Shake is a partner biologist working with Point Blue Conservation Science and Natural Resources Conservation Service in RCS. So he and I actually work out of the same field office in Woodland, Yellow County, California. And he works with private landowners on conservation planning and monitor soil plant and wildlife response to conservation projects in farm and ranch landscapes. He has worked here in the Sacramento Valley agroecosystems for nine years, and he has a master's degree in wildlife science. Corey has monitored bee and butterfly populations for three years in restored farm edge habitats in the Sacramento Valley. And today he will share the results of these counts and lessons learned for restoration planners and practitioners interested in improving habitat quality for pollinators. All right, so at this time, I invite Corey to hop on and start the presentation. Corey, if you could just uh, let me know when to advance. I will, yeah, I'll try to try to get that uh, to you. Um, but uh, OK, thanks, Brandy, for a great introduction. Um, you kind of set set everything up, so I don't need to say too much here. I, I do have to point out, so um, for those of you who are in California or the, those of you who might be familiar with Point Blue Conservation Science, we were formerly known as Point Reyes Bird Observatory. So even though I'm talking about bees and butterflies here, I had to put a bird on this slide, <laughs> not just because we're a lot of us are bird biologists, including myself, uh, kind of originally, but also because I did do um, some bird monitoring as part of this, but I'm not going to present the, those results here. So go ahead, next slide, Brandy. Okay, so just to give you the context of what I'm, you know, what what context I'm doing this work in or under what project, and this is all part of what's called the Yolo Creek and Community Partnership, partnership which is based here in Yolo County. Uh, it, it's been a partnership since 2013, and I joined basically in 2018, 2019. Um, and the goal of the partnership is to restore habitat in agricultural landscapes, both farms and ranches, um, but with the participation of the community in these restoration projects. So um, there's four, uh, local organizations involved, or five, I, should, or I guess four, and then uh, you know the NRCS is an integral part of this as well. But uh, the planning and implementation of these restoration projects that are done is are done by the our local resource conservation district, and uh, myself and other NRCS planners bring projects to this that then are kind of set up and implemented and. Um, planted in many cases and kind of lots of the work is done by the community. Uh, so the Center for Land-Based Learning, uh, which is based here in Yolo County and their SLUS program brings in high school students to to do a lot of the restoration work and then also Puda Creek Council uh, brings in members of the community to do the same. Uh, what I've added to this partnership in the last three years was biological monitoring and Brandon, if you could advance the slide, it's just going to give you just one click and it'll there you go. And and my part of this is is this biological monitoring is a big part of what I'm contributing here. And that's what I'm presenting. And that's, you know, essentially wanted to evaluate if if this partnership and projects are meeting the goals of high quality wildlife habitat and we specifically call, call out pollinators. And then, uh, you know, through that monitoring, try and provide ideas for how we can improve the projects going forward. Um, with the partnership, uh, and we and we received funding for this partnership through the Yochadihi Wintu Nations Community Fund. Next slide. Okay, so jumping right into uh, which projects I studied, um, there were uh, I think between thirteen to fifteen projects that were completed before I came on, twenty eighteen. And um, I selected the oldest ones because I wanted more mature sites. So ended up with eight restoration sites that were all planted between 2013 and 2016. So by the time I was monitoring, they were four to seven years old. Um, and that included three hedgerows and five riparian plantings. Um, these are really, the, what I have listed here as riparian are 
uh, restoration projects along between a farm edge or between a crop field and essentially a seasonal waterway um, where really the plants you're putting in are more upland plants than riparian plants, but they're on that, that edge between the waterway and the crop field. All of them have at least one row of woody plants, and then some of them there's understory restoration of native grasses or in some cases wildflowers were seeded or sometimes plug planted in to the site. Okay, here's a, here's some examples. Um, go ahead and click one more. Some of these slides, Brandy, are multiple clicks, so I'll just try to keep you on that. But here's an example of a single row hedgerow. This is our smallest site. You can see a native grass uh, um, understory kind of on the left there, also foxtails, but, <laughs> but uh, one single row of um, of shrubs and it's usually almost always shrubs and then occasionally some trees like this one has valley oaks in it and red buds a small tree okay next slide these are all just to give you a sense of what i'm working in here so and where i did my counts um so single row hedgerow here's another one but this one doesn't have a native grass on her story this is in well into the summer when the kind of just natural um annual grass and vegetation in the understory has turned nice and brown here in California. Also, you can notice it's smoky. That's often happens in our summers these days. OK, next slide, Brandy. These are actual pictures of like long transects often um, where I'm doing the bee and butterfly counts. So seasonal waterway. Here's one with a really nice uh, native undergrass or native uh, grass understory with a row of woody plants on either side. Next slide. This one's two clicks as well, and and this is another example where, you know, these seasonal waterways usually um, were planted with two to four rows of shrubs and then occasionally trees. Sometimes, like in this photo, they have some natural regeneration of plants or existing mature trees. Not very common. This one has that cottonwood in the background in the foreground, an elderberry and mule fat that were planted, and then down in the wa seasonal waterway, you know, some natural recruitment of willows. Okay, go ahead, Randy. Next slide. So uh, how I collected this information for these three years, 2019 through 2021, I collected, I counted bees and butterflies in three different seasons. First uh, in a single year, so April, May season, June, July, and September, October. And for the bees, I used uh, what's called the Streamline Bee Monitoring Protocol, which was developed by the Xerces Society and some universities, including our local UC Davis. Uh, and that uses a paired uh, 30 meter by one meter plot. Uh, so a strip and the, the example here is the in the map, that's two paired 30 meter transects uh, in yellow. And that's an actual location of one of my, my counts. Um, and then I would do three to four pairs, usually three, uh, one, we had one big site where I did four pairs uh, per site and they're randomly located across the site. And that amounted to 400 bee counts over the three years. And in this protocol, you don't actually, you know, identify individual species of bees. That's pretty hard to do. <laughs> Even if you capture them, it sometimes takes a while. So the protocol calls for just counting native bees versus honeybees. Okay. And then uh, butterflies. Um, I did a bigger transect here, kind of bigger plot size, so 100 meters long by 25 meters wide. And uh, usually it was two butterfly plots per site. And again, on that big site, I had four. In total, that amounted to 144 counts. And in the case of butterflies here in the Sacramento Valley, particularly in ag landscapes, uh, the butterfly diversity is not particularly high. And so identifying them on the wing, you know, with some, some training and skill and time to learn them uh, is doable so that I identified butterflies to species generally with a few exceptions of similar butterflies. Um, uh, but 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 mostly we've been able to get them to species. And then uh, at each of these sites, I looked at plants as well and recorded what species were actually visit, which species of plants, what their, their blooms were visited by either butterflies or bees. Also the species of plants that were just present in the plots and those that were blooming. And on the ones that were blooming um, in the bee plots, I really also went to the extent of estimating the abundance of those blooms, kind of on a kind of how many flowers available. Um, so hold it right there, a second, uh, Brandy. But yeah, so so that's um, 
so that I collected plant data with that. Um, now jumping straight into the results here, this is just so uh, on looking just at the graph here, you see um, this is all of my eight sites compared and just the this is just the average number of bees per count and in orange is average number of native bees, blue average number of honeybees. And um, this is uh, per count. So just I think so. So I think what I want to point out here on this graph is, first of all, honeybees, you see a lot of variation here that doesn't necessarily match with native bees. Um, and uh, important to point out here, we're not gonna, I'm not going to focus on honeybees largely because their abundance in the landscape, it does matter how many, you know, what, what's at this site, but also it, it matters, you know, how most of these bees or all the honeybees come from uh, managed hives, uh, so bee boxes. So if you have more bee boxes in the landscape, you're probably going to have more honeybees on your site. So really focus in on native bees here. And you can see it varies quite a bit between sites, uh, the average number of bees per count. But you can also, I think what's really important here is that in these, this is the paired plot, so 60 meters squared. On the average across all of the counts, all 400 counts, we only saw 2.4 native bees per per count. Um, and that's not exactly teeming with bees, you know, in a, an area that's 30 meters by one meter long or wide. Um, and so I want to compare that. I think an interesting comparison here, go ahead, Brandy, and click again, is uh, to put that in. Um, in one study found that, you know, they did these dense wildflower plantings where there's annual and perennial wildflowers in the dense 45 meter squared plot. And they were getting on the average between 30 and 80 native bees per, per plot. So and that's an order of magnitude more than what we're seeing in our habitats. So I think it's important contrast here to say that, you know, that when you have more dense floral resources, you definitely can see an even greater response from bees. So let's go ahead to um, the next slide. So that kind of leads into here. Well, yeah, obviously the amount of blooms that are out there and the amount of floral resources, it's definitely tied to the abundance of those bees. And in, in my study, this, this graph shows that, yeah, indeed that is the case um, when we look at native bees per count compared to this uh, indexed abundance of blooms that I used. But it's not a great predictor. Go ahead and click again, Brandy. So it, it it's it's decently predicts what's going on here, but you see there's a lot of additional variation going on there. And I'm not going to cover this, and I haven't had the opportunity to really dive in and model this, what's causing this other variation here and understand what that is. But just through observations, I know that, you know, there's seasonal variation one. I haven't split out the data by season yet. There's also annual variation. I saw over the three years my bee abundance numbers decline and probably related to, to drought and, and uh, you know, the amount of flower resources related to drought. But also landscape can affect what's going on here on these sites. You know, some are, are um, way out in the middle of the valley and far away from any uh, wild habitat nearby, and some are a lot closer to that. And finally, you know, not all blooms, so we could have a lot of blooms, but not all blooms are from different species are created equal. Bees tend to prefer some over others and maybe don't even use certain ones. So oh, I wanna to touch on that point on the next slide. Go ahead. So this is looking, and just stay right there. Um, this is looking at, basically I wanna compare the abundance of blooms, like which species of plants had the most abundant blooms. That's this list here. Here's my top 10 list in my study within the plots where I was doing bee counts. Um, and then compare that to native bee uh, visitation, essentially. So you look at this list, you see some of the native plants that we planted as part of the restoration. You see California buckwheat, blue elderberry, California rose, quail bush, gum plant, Cleveland sage. Um, but you also see the introduced annual and perennial plants that provide flowers that are used by bees. I'll show that later, but so bindweed, mustard, star thistle, 
Um, and now, now let's compare that. Go ahead and click again, Brandy. To and this is also just plants that were, you know, at least they were found over at least five percent of the sites, the the plot areas. So when we compare that to this is this is this is um, which of these species were by native bees relative to their abundance. So um, you see different species rise up here and you see some fall off that original list. So Cleveland sage, gum plant and buckwheat still sit, stay high on the list. Um, rose drops a little bit and then notably blue elderberry, quail bush, they drop off that list completely. And in fact, you know, saw pretty, pretty low or on quail bush, um, almost no visitation of those species by bees. Um, but then you also see some of the, the introduced plants, so mustards and bindweed still stay up uh, on this list and star thistle. And another one rise up, Italian thistle. <laughs> some of you might be cringing right now. Um, but go ahead and click again, Brandy, just once. So when I put this in context of other studies, this is really similar to what other people have seen. Um, uh, there's a study here again in Yolo County where they found that, you know, these exotic plants were not preferred by bees, but they were definitely used. So they they mentioned mustards and bindweed, but they also uh, pointed out some of the most preferred native plants and it matches with mine. So Cleveland sage, buckwheat, gum plant were on high on their list of most preferred native plants. Um, and then uh, let's go ahead and do the next slide here. Uh, one Final point about, um, or one quick point about butterflies. I'm not, you know, really haven't dove into that data much yet, but I think worth pointing out here is that one, you know, according, you can see on this graph, this is, this is uh, butterfly diversity is, is the orange bar. So number of species per count or richness of butterflies. And you can see that in my landscapes, it's not very high. It's one to two species on average, usually. And then number of individual butterflies of any species per count, uh, kind of abundance of butterflies is in blue there. Um, but I so I want to point out that one, it's not super diverse um, uh, uh, butterfly assemblages here, but our communities, but there is, you know, some important details. So go ahead and click again once, Brandy. Um, the five most common species of butterflies here were cabbage whites, orange sulfurs, Buckeyes, Eastern Tail Blues, and Aquaman Blues. And I point these out um, because it connects to my next point here. You know, each of these species, just like a monarch butterfly, has its uh, host plant, the milkweed, where it lays eggs and the caterpillars eat that plant to, and, and are reared on that plant and then turn into an adult butterfly. All these other butterflies have specific host plants as well, not necessarily as narrow as um, milkweeds and monarchs, but they have a set of plants that they need. So go ahead and click again, Brandy. So an important observation, though, I don't bear that out here in the data, but just kind of an observation is that it seems that the presence and abundance of these butterfly species um, seems really more tied to the availability of these host plants than it does to the abundance of blooms in many cases. You have to have some baseline uh, blooms for them to nectar on and to, to have food resources. But it's also the, the food resources for the caterpillars, the larva, larva that are really important here. So go ahead and click on Brandy. Um, so just distilling this down, the key results of what I've seen um, is that first of all, you know, there there are native bees using these habitats. It's well known here in New York County. They're important for native bees. But when you look at it relative to a dense wildflower planting, the the native bee densities are kind of low. Um, so uh, another important point here is that, you know, as we would expect, no surprise, native bee abundance is greater with a higher bloom abundance or more floral area. Um, but some plants are more more preferred than others or, or, you know, used more or less by native bees. And finally, what I just said about butterfly abundance and richness being tied to host plants, I think is an important point here. Go ahead, Brandy. Um, so those results, even though they're not groundbreaking, these things that other people have found, I think they kind of help lead us to, you know, how we can improve these habitats for pollinators here in Yolo County. But this, I think these principles, you know, expand beyond Yolo County. It's important, you know, there's people from lots of other places here potentially 
and be beyond the Central Valley. Um, but so I'll make these points and, and generally I think they can be applied to to most places. So just creating first point on bees on native bees, creating more dense floral resources is really critical. And there's there's different ways you can do that. I think one way, you know, is one ensure survival of your plants. So you could on, from the design standpoint, you could plant more densely, make sure that you have continuous shrub cover and then make sure you take care of those plants. So survival is good. That was a problem in a few of our sites. But overall, survival was decent. Um, but then focus on those really attractive shrubs, um, uh, and which I have a list of actually after this that I know we're probably running up on time here, so we might just um, pop through them pretty quick. But then the final point, though, on that this is that whenever and however you can incorporate wildflowers into these plantings, not just the, the shrubs, but um, perennial and annual wildflowers, I'd say do it and try and get more of that floral cover, uh, floral resources. So for butterflies, I think there's a variety of, uh, so I think the key point here on butterflies is to know um, and learn your local butterfly fauna, what species you'd expect to be here, and then understand what are their host plants and try and find native plant species that butterflies and, and diversify that set of plants to include um, butterfly host plants. And finally, on the point of introduced um, and or weedy plants, I think <laughs> this is an important point um, is, you know, if the these other introduced plants aren't directly posing a threat to crops, that's hugely important or harboring, um, you know, pests, insects. Um, and and also if they don't um, kind of potentially harm the natives that you're trying to establish, I'd say be careful not to eliminate them if you don't have to. Um, you know, don't you re reduce your herbicide or mowing or whatever that you might be use otherwise if they're not a really important or direct threat to, to other things. So because they can be important um, plants for bees, for, for nectar and pollen, but also for butterflies as larval hosts. So uh, Brandy, I go ahead and click the next slide. This is just a, oh, got, Oh, OK, this, I forgot I didn't switch this version around. So um, I think I'm Brandy. If, I think I'm at my 20 minutes, I'm sure. Um, but I would like these. I'll actually why don't we why don't we take questions? And um, I have essentially lists here of preferred shrubs and wildflowers and then native host plants for our, our local area. And then the final one on some of these important if you click one more, these important um, uh, yeah, introduced plants or weedy plants. Um, uh, but I think I'll rather take questions here. And then if people want to look at some of those specific lists, you can just ask in a question and we can talk about some of the specific plants. So yeah, if you leave it on this slide, I think we're in good shape. And I'll take questions whenever we're ready. I don't know how much time we have for that. But Perfect. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, you had plenty of time. Sorry, we got started a little late because of our <laughs> technical difficulties, but all is well. Um, OK, so. We I'm trying to get to the point where I could see my chat window, so I might have to do that. I apologize. OK. I'm also not seeing my chat window, so I may have missed some of that. Yeah, no worries. Um, OK, we're getting back up here. All right, so. And, and it might be useful if once you do get your chat up to put the slides back up, hopefully, uh, just so we can if people want to see the I'd like to show those um, lists if we have time after questions. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so. We have a few comments in here. Um, Carl is suggesting that we check out prairie strips for pollinator habitats. He's provided a link. Thank you, Carl. And then also the vital role of pollinators in agriculture. He's provided a link. Thank you, Carl. And unfortunately, it looks like no slides were appearing on his screen. I hope those eventually popped up for him. Um, he did say it sounds like the key is biodiversity in the habitat. Any thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, 
That's a that's I think a simplified statement, and I think I'd go more specifically to saying it's not just about biodiversity; it's about um, more about floral resources. Biodiversity is an important part of it, but it's about providing more preferred plants and more uh, and and which would be in some of those lists that I have more preferred plants and and focusing specifically so preferred for nectar and pollen for bees but then also host plants I think that's a really big one that we we generally overlook is we know about monarchs and and milkweeds we know milkweeds are important but there's this whole other set of plants that you have to you know consider and, and try and incorporate more of those into restoration projects in order to provide for those other butterfly species. Yeah, thank you. All right, I do see we have one more question in the chat and we also have a hand raised. So let's switch over to the hand raised real quick. Rob, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please do so. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. This is Rob Roy, I'm part of SWCS. Thank you, great presentation. Uh, I have th th three things. Um, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll try to do them real quick here, but um, I, was, I was hoping to, <clears throat> and I was a little late, so I apologize if you went over this, but I'd, I'd like to see the list of what you were calling native bees. I was just kind of interested in that. I don't know if you went over that, but that would be real interesting to see. And then I also um, wanted to uh, applaud you for, you know, not excluding introduced plants. Uh, because, I, you know, in, in just some of our, in my yard here, where we have a lot of, uh, a lot of plants and a lot of uh, invertebrates, uh, we see some of the introduced plants really attracting uh, bees, native bees. Uh, for example, torch dithonia, uh, which is native to Mexico. And so that brings up my next question for you is, when does a native plant, once it's hybridized in industry and a nursery, when does it become or does it become not a native anymore? Okay, okay good questions. And I'll, I'll address your first question was about, you know, what's what falls in that native bee category here. So. Um, the protocol that I used is designed, and you can you can look it up on Xerces website. You know it has all the details, but really it's just designed to capture, like I said, native bees and versus honeybees, and and um, so native bees is going to include anything that is in um, uh, you know that uh, I guess it's you know the, the bee um, order, not an order. It's a <laughs> genus. I, don't know, I guess it's probably family of bees, but anyway, it includes, no, it's, it's an order, but anyway, um, it's all, you know, it would be things you think of. So from, from the tiniest little sweat bees up to, um, the biggest carpenter bees and many things in between. What I see a lot of are, you know, uh, small and mid-sized bees, um, and all the way up and then bumblebees, actually, that's an interesting one here in the Valley. I almost saw none. I uh, saw so one. I had one or two counts where we got bumblebees, so that's kind of an unfortunate situation. But anyway, that's the range of native bees, and then honeybees are okay, European, but not not hymenoptera, and then like the little wasps. You didn't. So you didn't yeah, count. so you're excluding wasps, flies, and anything that's. So it's all just um, bees, you know, defined as um, uh, kind of the, you know, those that have branched hairs and and aren't you know aren't wasps and or hornets or the other um, uh, cool, meat eating. Thanks types yeah so um and then you, to your other question about native plants you know um i myself tend to focus on the functional traits of plants um and then also kind of putting that in balance of the kind of the ecological functional traits of plants and that's and that's kind of one of the most important things that i consider but also you know i think it's important to avoid impacts to to native populations um native populations of plants so so i guess in general to your question um you know we can consider native versus non-native native in different ways but in my mind 
especially in these uh, kind of these agricultural landscapes where you're well isolated from native populations of plants. I think there's a lot of plant materials that you can and could, you know, should use here. Um, I know there's differences potentially in, in how much pollen and nectar they produce, if they're hybridized or not. There's some, some concerns there, but I don't know, you know, the science behind those concerns or how, how valid some of those are. But really, for me, it's a focus on are they in this case, if your target is pollinators, are they providing are they are they really attractive to species um, of bees and butterflies? Um, and, you know, do they also have important other functional traits as well? So that kind of answered it. <laughs> I don't know if I got it directly. Hey, Any other Corey, questions? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I have just follow up questions, uh, you know, just uh, additional information about the native bees. You know, native bees actually is very much, you know, they are very efficient compared to just uh, the regular bees. You know, uh, from the literature I found that, you know, one acre of apple to pollinate by the, uh, the regular bees takes about like 60,000 to uh, 120,000 bees. Whereas native bees, like Amazon bees, uh, can pollinate 200, uh, actually 250 to 750 uh, Mason B can actually pollinate that amount of one acre of apple. Yeah, so the efficiency of these native bees, you know, how we can promote those things and and to see this kind of results, like, you know, in case of, uh, let's say, al almond production, so almond pollin pollinations, this kind of things. So you have, do you have anything in your mind to do that kind of things? Um, yeah, th so those are good points. And I, I know that Neil Williams at UC Davis and, and his students and our, our colleagues have worked to address that. And there, there was a published paper essentially, I think related to almonds or some information I saw. I don't know if I, you know, I'd have to go looking for it, but essentially that how and there's others in tomato crops and stuff, how native bees can increase efficiencies or increase seed set in some cases um, for some some of our crop types. But so it is important that when you put these habitats and farm edges, you know, we're not it's not just talking about conserving bees here, but it's also in many cases it can can positively influence the crops to some extent. You know, that's a that's a variable extent there and it depends on the crop. But in all kinds of systems, sunflowers, um, tomatoes, almonds, I've seen some information regarding how na the, the native wild bees can influence, you know, the work of the honeybees or, or complement the work of the honeybees managed hives. Okay, Brandy, I bet that's about time. Are we, do we have any time for? Yeah, just one more question in the chat, um, and it's a good one. So, Oh my gosh, where did it go? Jessica wants to know that you said there's not an abundance of butterflies. Did you look at the pesticide residue in the plants that would host the larva? Yeah, yeah, very good question. And that's that's important in these landscapes, right? You know, potentially both the bees and the butterflies could be subject to pesticide impacts. Um, and I to to clear up you know one point I didn't necessarily say that butterflies weren't abundant I said they weren't necessarily very diverse like compared to if you go into a um, a rangeland or oak woodland riparian area you can see a lot more species of butterflies in a, in a wildland compared to down here in the valley and and sometimes the abundance of those butterflies can be impressive um, when there's a you know you know, when you're next to an alfalfa field, for example, and there's orange sulfurs flying all around, or there's a migration of other species like painted ladies. Um, but the point on pesticides is 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 definitely important. And there's I did not look at any of those and didn't really have a good way to do that. Um, the only kind of anecdote that I have, um, and it's and I'm not suggesting any causation here or that is that this is the link, but where I did the site that had the the highest, I think um, I think it was definitely abundant or diversity of native bees um, was on an organic um, farm. I have one one of my sites was an organic farm, so there there might be kind of some differences depending on crop type there that could be related to 
across my eight sites that could could have been related to kind of pesticide um, abundance in the environment and and the host plant one specific yeah I don't definitely didn't look at and don't know very very good thank you all right so yes we are running low on time so Corey if you don't mind um if we can share your slides that you wanted to share there at the end maybe on our our chat or um excuse me our website that would be great as a resource yeah, for sure um, and I think they made it into the recording as you flip through them too so that's yes, great so briefly okay great thanks yes thank you very much Corey just a quick reminder that this is recorded and as we transition to our next speaker we're going